Let's pray, and then I'm going to talk for a few minutes about my topic today. I didn't get up to say all that, but it came out. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Please help us today to be faithful. Help us to be faithful to you. Help us to love you and come to a place, Lord, where we're not of the world. That we're not identifying with the world and the world system. Help us to understand today that we are citizens of heaven. And that the laws of heaven govern our behavior. Lord, we want to be children of God. And help us, Father, to understand more clearly what that means and what that entails. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. <clears throat> death is, in fact, the pathway to life. Now, love and death are two words that we use in Scripture, and <clears throat> it can be confusing sometimes because in both cases, we use these two words to address very different things. When we as Christians, for example, speak about death, we are not necessarily talking about uh, something that is intrinsically a bad thing. In fact, in most cases, we are speaking about a very good thing. It all depends on our perspective. Generally, when we speak about death, we're speaking about three different things. And I want to talk about very quickly uh, each one. The first one is the first death or the death of sleep. When we say someone died, we're talking about the first death. Everybody, unless you're alive when Jesus comes, will experience that. And everybody is going to be resurrected from that. The second death is eternal death. There is no return from the second death. If you experience the second death, that's forever. It's everlasting. Now, the good news is that Jesus died that second death. And that death no longer have power over those who are in Christ Jesus. In fact, the Bible tells us that death is the final enemy that's going to be destroyed. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says this. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And then Revelation 20, 14 says, And death and hell, that is the grave, place of the dead, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So the first death, everybody experiences, everybody is raised from it. The second death, if you experience the second death, it's forever. No one comes back from that one. Now, the next death that the Bible talks about is the death to self and sin. This death is our participation in the death that Christ died for all of us. And it's the death that we experience while we are still living. Thank you. <laughs> now, to, to Christians, all three of these that we just described, first death, second death, and the death of Christ that we participate in while we're living, all of these represent, in our theology, pathways to life. And we should embrace them. We should embrace the first death because we will rise from the first death and we will be forever with the Lord. We should embrace the second death because Jesus died that death and we experience 
our own death in him, we don't have to worry about that one. Now, this brings me to the topic that I want to briefly discuss today, and that is this third death, which is death to self and sin. This is the struggle that you struggle with. It's the struggle that I struggle with. It's the struggle that every person struggles with. Now, this concept is harder for us to get our arms around um, primarily because of the word death or die. But again, as Christians, as people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we must embrace it. Now, the big question is, why does anyone need to die to self in the first place? And how do you accomplish that death, assuming that you even want it? Now, the larger issue when we're discussing this death to self and sin is really not about dying so much as it is really about living it is about the kind of life that we are presenting to God and to the world. What kind of life are we going to live after we have died with Christ to sin? John chapter 12, verse 24. This is what he says here. Jesus is speaking, by the way. John chapter 12, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Then he goes on to say, he that loves his life shall lose it, and he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Now, here is a natural and spiritual truth. That which is dead and seems the most insignificant holds within itself a powerful potential for life, explosive life. But that potential can never be realized until the thing is dead. 1 Corinthians 15.36, the apostle writes, You fool, that which you sow is not made alive except it die. In other words, unless the thing, and in our case the person, unless the person truly dies, they can never experience new life. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, and he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. There is no life in Christ possible. It is impossible to experience new life in Christ unless a death has occurred first. This is why when we baptize people, we go through a 
really strenuous interrogation, if you will. And the reason for that is to ensure that they are truly dead. Because baptism is a burial, is it not? You wouldn't bury somebody who was still alive. I mean, even if they were half dead. It would be criminal to to bury them. If they were 80 or 90 percent dead, you wouldn't bury them. Before you put a person in the grave, and that's what that baptismal represents, it is a watery grave, they must be 100% dead. And this is part of the problem that we experience right now in God's church. We don't make sure people are dead before we dunk them. And the reality is, they go in there a dry center and they come out a wet center. Because they never died. The Bible is clear. I'm not making this up. This is not the gospel according to Tim. This is the Bible. Whosoever will lose his life, the same shall find it or save it. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. If a person is crucified, are they living or dead? They are stone graveyard dead. And Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. In other words, I am a dead person. Then he goes on to say, remarkably, nevertheless, I live. How is that possible? You're dead, but you're living? Well, he explains it. Then he says, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I'm not living it myself. I'm living it by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the old life, essentially is what he said, that old life, the old me, no longer exists. That person is dead. And now I'm living not my life, my old life. I'm not running things. I'm living the life of Jesus. It's the life of Jesus. Here's what we're missing in the church. Here's what we're missing in church members. The life of Jesus. Because we still want to make our own decisions. We still want to do our own thing. We still want to have our druthers. I talk to people all the time. Well, brother, I hear what you're saying, but we have meetings. Well, I would come out, but... When we're doing evangelism, and by the way, I'm not trying to pick on anybody. The person I'm trying to pick on most is Tim today. But if the shoe fits. (laughs) I would do this, but when we have a series of meetings like we just had, There are a few people that were very, very faithful to those meetings. Church members were here virtually every night. But for the most part, this place was empty, except for the few guests that we had coming and the few faithful church members. Do you realize that when we send out these invitations and people come, and they're coming expecting because we say, Reserve your seat. Come on. We got, we got place for you, but we want to know if you're coming. And they say, oh, we want to come. And they come, and they look around. We're the only ones here. What do you think that communicates to the people? It is not important to these people that come to this church. So why should it be important to me? I mean, I see all these chairs. I see all these seats. 
but I don't see anybody in them, so what am I doing here? And they come the first night, and the next night, they don't come back. Except for the, 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 the hardcore ones, who God is speaking to their hearts, and they're listening, and, 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 and they, they will press through. But I'm looking for not just a few, I want them all. But it's not possible for us to reach our community if we're not arm in arm, moving together, online, facing the enemy. Because this is who we're facing. We're facing an enemy that is relentless. We are doing battle with the principalities and the powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age. Church, we are engaged in a life and death struggle, not just for those people out there, but for our very own lives. And if you think, if I think for a minute that because I stand up here and preach messages to you or because you come to church once a week, That you're going to stroll up and I'm going to stroll up to the pearly gates. And Jesus is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Think again. Because God has something greater than what we're doing for us to do. And he's wanting us as a people. He's wanting me as a person. Because I, I'm seeing my own deficiencies. As I'm praying and looking to God, I'm seeing my own deficiencies. Because remember, the issue often comes down to leadership. But each one of us has have a responsibility. We have a responsibility before God to say, God... I am a soldier in your army. And the Apostle Paul says, no one that wars, no one that wars, war means fighting. No one that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. But their focus is steadily on the one who who has called them to be a soldier. And brothers, it's time that we, God's people, as they used to say, grab on to the horns of the altar, cry out to God as never before, because people are going to a Christless grave all around us, and we are marking time. You know what marking time is? You're just going like this. You're not going anywhere, but it's pretend marching. (laughs) We're just marking, not going any place, marking time. I don't want to mark time. So I think I'll stop. (laughs) How about that, Steve? I think I'll stop. I think I'll stop marking time. I think... I think I, 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 I'm, I think I will be and desire to be everything that God has intended for me to be. And not pretend like I know what that is. But just say, God, here I am, whatever you want, I'm, I'm, I'm available. Whatever it is. And not pretend like I know I got it all together and I've got it all figured out. No, God, here I am. I'm before you. I'm crying out to you. Whatever you want me to do, here I am, do it. And mean it with all my heart. Where was I? Galatians 2.20? I'm dead, crucified. But I'm living. But I'm not living It's Christ who lived in the old person no longer exists. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
He loved me so much that he gave, gave himself for me, and I want to identify with that death. When Jesus died on the cross, as far as God is concerned for us and what we have to be, have the same, the same position in him is that when Jesus died, I died. When Jesus died, you died. In other words, you are dead. And the only life that is available to us is his life. And if the only life that's available to us is his life, then I am not in charge. He's in charge. And when we, the church, come, to come together on that one biblical truth, which is the most profound truth in all of the Bible, then the church begins to move forward together. Like one unit, one fighting unit, we're moving forward together no one is breaking rank. No one is looking that way and that way. We're all looking forward together. And we're moving forward together. Why? Because we are dead. And it is the life of Christ that moves us and motivates us. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. What does that mean, I wonder? I wonder what that really means. Do you really think it means what it says? I mean, I mean do, you really, do you really believe that? Let me read that again. If you then be risen with Christ, are we risen with Christ? Seek those things which are, where? Above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are what? You're dead. You're dead. But I have this opinion. You're dead. Well, I have this feeling, this strong inclination. You're dead. Everything that motivates us is not from our old life, but everything that motivates us is from Jesus. Jesus says, take up your cross daily, follow me. And your life, so you still have a life, but you're dead. Now, I know this is a great dichotomy. We're dead people, but we're still living. Hallelujah. And your life, here it is, is hid with Christ in God. So what you're dead to is that old life. You're still living, but the life that you're living now is hid with Christ in God. In other words, your life is inside of God with Jesus. That's where our place of existence is. That's why we are not setting our affections. on. The, yeah, we got to have places to live. Yeah, we got to eat. Yeah, we got to drive cars. We got to do all those things. My affection is not on any of those. There's not a single thing that I possess that I'm not willing to give away today if God said to give it away. I had a brand new house, lived in it for three years. I felt led to give it away. I gave it away. Straight up, you gave away your house. Yeah, I did. I cannot tell you how many cars and those kind of things. God said, give it away. Give it away. Got a new motorcycle. My brother-in-law needs a motorcycle. Give it away. And I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back. I'm saying that 
because I wanted to live out this principle that I'm not attached to this stuff. And by the way, this message is for me. I'm, I'm the recipient of it. I'm not attached to this stuff. Nothing down here piques my interest that I've got to just have it and I can't turn it loose. I want to go to heaven. <laughs> I want to go to heaven. I want to live there. And when Christ, verse 4, Colossians 3, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Amen. Hallelujah. These are scriptures that points to both death and the pathway to life. Romans chapter 6, verse 9. Knowing this, that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died... He died unto sin once. But in that he lives, he lives unto who? God. Verse 11. Likewise, that means for us in the same way. Reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he goes on to say, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it and its lusts. So a dead person <clears throat> does not have sin ruling in their even the physical body that we're still in. This is at the core of the issue of dying to self. It is really dying to sin and being alive to God. What did Jesus die for on that cross? Our sins. Our sin. To redeem us. He was the sacrificial lamb. You know in the sanctuary service, the person bringing the sacrifice laid their hands on the lamb transferred their sin to the lamb, and the lamb paid the penalty of death. Our sins, Jesus took upon himself and died. We must participate in that death to have our sins washed away. All of them. And you can't be 50% in it. Well, part way, yes, I, I, I can do this, but I can see this part, but I just can't do that. I can't tell you how many people we've had come through meetings that because they had issues with something in the message, Sabbath, I can do this, but I can't let go of that. Had a guy in, we were in Oregon, I think. He had a background similar to mine. In fact, he was from the same city that I was from, Sacramento, California. But we were doing a meeting in, uh, wherever that place was in Oregon, in Dallas, Oregon. And he came to the meetings. He said, I'm a motorcycle mechanic. I believe the message. I believe everything. But if I keep Sabbath, because that's our bu one of our busiest days of the week. If I keep Sabbath, I'll lose my job. So although I agree with everything, <clears throat> I cannot accept That I'm, well, it wasn't accept. He said, I cannot not work on the Sabbath, which is the same as saying I can't accept this. 
I'm, I've met hundreds of people like that. But then I met people on the other side of the ledger. One brother, we were in Texas. He had the same issue. He wanted to be baptized, wanted to be part of God's church. But I have to work on Sabbath. I'm, I'm, I work in the parts department at this big automobile de dealership, and they rotate us. I don't work every Sabbath. On the Sabbath that I don't work, I can come to church. But then on the Sabbath that I do work, I can't come. So I said to him, brother, which is more important to you? Being dead to yourself in this life and being alive to God or holding on to something that has no eternal value for you. I said, here's what you do. You go in there again and you tell them that you cannot work on Sabbath and will not. He did. He marched into the boss's office the next, the next Monday, and he says, I'm sorry, but I have become a Seventh-day Adventist, and I, Sabbath is our day of worship, and I cannot work on Sabbath. And you know what they did? The boss says, man, this guy's a good employee. So they promoted him made him the manager. And he, as he became the manager, he said, you can choose whatever day you want to work. <laughs> God is good. He became the boss. And then he didn't never assign himself to work on Sabbath. But that's just one of many. I've, you know, there's... All kinds of reasons that we have to hold on to this life because of relationship. What will my family say? What will my, what will my wife or husband do? That is not a dead person. The person who has died doesn't care what happens here. They only care about what happens in Christ. That is what motivates them. In Christ, because I am going to be in Christ, even if I have to physically die, I'm going to be in Christ. That's the position of the martyrs. You realize that people died for this. Because they weren't willing to compromise. They weren't willing to acquiesce to the pressures around them. They said, even if it costs me my life. I'm going to stand here on this truth. And they died. Some of them gruesome, horrible deaths. But the blood of the martyrs has given us this wonderful, wonderful legacy and truth. Now, this is at the core of this issue. And what it really is, here really, what it is really, is really dying to the source of sin. And the source of it is rebellion, selfishness, which is pride. That's what we die to. We die to rebellion. We die to selfishness, which is pride. Remember in the Garden of Eden, the devil made his temptation uh, uh, to Adam and Eve. And he told Eve, you will be like God. What did he appeal to? Pride. And here's the irony of that statement. They were already like God. <laughs> they were already like God. God made them in his own image. And the devil comes along and says, you will be like God. They can say, what are you talking about? I'm already like God. Get out of here. <laughs> right? <laughs> but he appealed to a pride element. He planted that thought in their minds. Now, dying to self is the reverse of the condition that he used to, on them. He said, take your eyes off of God, put your eyes on yourself. When we die to self, the opposite transaction happens. We take our eyes off of ourselves and put our eyes on God. No longer focused on self, Always focused on God. 
always focused on God. Because whatever you need, God's going to provide for you. The only, <clears throat> we're not talking about groveling and crawling around in the dirt and flagellating ourselves and, 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 and not having our needs met. No, we're talking about something much higher than that. It's the source. We are not the source. God becomes the source. We look not to ourselves to provide. We look to God to provide, and he always provides. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So we take our eyes off of ourselves. It's the very opposite of what the devil had them do in the garden. Take your eyes off of God. Put your eyes on yourself. And now you're in trouble. Jesus comes. Take your eyes off of yourself. Put your eyes on him. Identify with the cross. Die there. And now you have a brand new identity. And it's with Christ in God. Some people are deceived. They, they call themselves Christians, but they are still in charge of their lives. If you're in charge of your life, then God's not in charge of it. If you feel like you are in charge, God is not in charge of it. There can't be two kings on the throne. Now, some might be saying today, yes, I really want to die to self. I really want Christ Jesus to live in me. I'm just having... Such a struggle with it. And if you are, I, everybody in this room, myself, everybody else, can identify with that struggle. We all can, because this is the fight of faith that we're fighting. But there's a simple key to the whole problem and the whole issue. And it's called surrender. For all practical intentions... Death to self is tantamount. It's the same as surrender to God. Let go. Let God be in charge. Surrender everything to him. The work has already been done, but we have to choose to surrender to it. Now, we can't make ourselves become anything. But we can make a choice to surrender to the power of Christ. He's already died for us. And he produces in us, as we surrender to him, new life. His life, not our own. His. So how do we surrender? It sounds good. So how do we do it? I believe we do it in two steps. The first step is, I call it theoretical. It's like <clears throat> we make a choice. You hear, we hear a message or we, there's a call made. And in our hearts, we say, I want to surrender to God. I want to surrender to Christ. And somebody may make it even an altar call or something or fill out a decision card, something like that. And we make that choice. Lord, I really want to surrender to you. We come forward and we pray. I call that theoretical surrender. The next step, I call this step practical surrender. It's now after you've made your choice, theoretical choice, the devil doesn't go away. <laughs> in fact, he may send in reinforcements. And... The next thing is practical surrender. That is, at the point of temptation, when the, the enemy comes in, at the point of temptation, then we surrender to God. Then, whenever the temptation is right then and there, I surrender to God. That's practical to surrender. Something is going on, surrender to God. Eyes off of self, eyes off of conditions, looking to God. And both of these are necessary. I have to make up my mind that I'm going to surrender to God and, and do so in my heart. That's theoretical. But the practical application of it is when the temptation comes, at that point of temptation, I surrender to God. I don't yield to the temptation. I take my eyes off of myself, my flesh, because my flesh wants to do that thing. 
And it's pulling hard on me. And I turn to God. And I look to Him. By the way, if you make it, if you make it your practice during that time, to go to God, and I don't care where you are, is to cry out to God in prayer. The devil won't bother you so much because he'll find out that his temptations are driving you to prayer. And he doesn't want you praying. Both are necessary. Here I am. Jesus is right here. I've made a, I responded to the call. Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Theoretical. Jesus takes a step forward. And he says, follow me. Now, I've surrendered at least practically, I mean, uh, theoretically. Now, my practical application is when Jesus takes a step or he says, follow me, I take a step. I can have theoretical surrender all day long and Jesus could be two miles down the road and I'm still standing in the same place saying, I surrendered my heart to God. That's where people are in the church today. I was baptized in 1972. Or I was baptized in 1955. And I'm still in the church today. Theoretical surrender. They haven't followed Jesus anywhere. Just as cold, hard, self-centered led by the flesh as they were when they got baptized. you got to have both. we got to say yes to Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. And we have to follow him. We, have not, we do not have to yield to temptation. We can go to God because the life that I'm living in the flesh, I'm living by the faith of the Son of God. My life is hid with Christ in God. I surrender to God. I want to, I want to be a more healthy person. I've come to the Diabetes Undone seminar. <laughs> and I've learned some things about green light food, yellow light food, and red light foods. And I'm sitting at the table. And I've eaten all that I know that I need to eat. But my flesh says, one piece of pie. Just one piece of pie. Then the struggle starts. Or we get hit and with fears. You know what I discovered? Dead people are not afraid of anything. <laughs> you can't scare a dead person. All the old habits, old forms of disobedience, all those things, they don't, they don't pull you away if you've truly died. And you've made that decision, and wherever Jesus leads, that's where we'll go. Surrendering to Christ, theoretically and practically, is in fact dying to self. Let me read you as we finish here this one quote from Steps to Christ, you'll find it on page 58. And uh, whoever's going to do our closing song, you can come up now. <clears throat> it says this, Steps to Christ, page, five, uh, page 58. If we are Christ, our thoughts are with him, and our sweetest thoughts are of him. All we have and are is consecrated to him. We long to bear his image, breathe his spirit, do his will, and please him in all things. That's the pathway to life. And only a person who has died and is now alive in Christ, can do these things. I'm going to read it one more time. If we are Christ, our thoughts are with him. Our sweetest thoughts are of him. All we have and are is consecrated 
to him. We long to bear his image, breathe his spirit, do his will, and please him in all things. Amen. May God grant each one of us the heart desire to be a people who are truly dead to the world and dead to sin. And be able to say, as Paul says, I am crucified to the world and the world is crucified to me. And that our life is not lives that we're living based on our thinking. That our lives are lives that are lived based on the leading of Jesus Christ himself. That we're following him. We're not following the world. We're not following our own thoughts and imaginations. We're following Jesus. And may that be our portion today. And as we sing our closing song, it is hymn number 311, I Would Be Like Jesus. Please stand as we close. (laughs) 